Hello, and welcome to Sobercast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting Sobercast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Good evening, everybody. My name is Mariana, and I'm an alcoholic. I wish you could all unmute and I could hear you, but hey, there we go. Um, hmm. I thought long and hard about how to start this share, and I must have uh, practiced it about a hundred million times. But in my experience, um, having shared a number of times, is that actually has to come from the heart, and actually, there's no good practicing anything. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to tell you my story, my experience, my strength, my hope. And if there are newcomers tonight, I'd like to suggest that you actually listen to the similarities, not the differences. Uh, You will find a lot of differences because my story is mine and it's not yours. But there are things in common with all of us. So I hope that you get something out of it. Um, Everybody starts with the beginning of their drinking history, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm going to be doing the same, but extremely briefly. So I came from an ordinary, normal family. Absolutely nothing extraordinary happened. My father was in the army. We moved around a lot. Um, we, I was born in England. We moved to Germany. We moved to Italy. We moved to England when I was about eight. I stayed until I was about 18. I went to a foreign school, so I ended up with a lot of languages. Uh, My life was perfectly normal. I started, um, I had a a girlfriend who who used to, basically, the two of us started drinking at the age of 14. And um, my drinking was not unreasonable. It was like the occasional drink, etc. And then um, I left home at 18. And then when I left home at 18, all bets were off. Nobody to supervise me because I'd moved not just towns, not just countries, but continents. And I'd moved to what was in those days called Rhodesia, and today it's called Zimbabwe. I went on holiday, took one look at the beautiful weather, and decided that I didn't want want to go back to England to my horrible job working in a tax office of an oil company, Yerk. And uh, my relationship had fallen through, Yerk. So I was going to start again, which is what I did. I liked it so much that I decided to find a house, somewhere to stay and uh, get a job. And within a couple of months, that's exactly what I did. During this time, I I was drinking. And there is no doubt that my drinking was already out of hand. Um, It wasn't uh, totally hopeless, but it was definitely more than I wanted. And my behavior uh, was not very ladylike, shall we just say. And then after about three years of this, I decided I didn't like who I was becoming. It seems to be a regular thing for me, (laughs) like who I was becoming. So I thought I would change. And I, um, this man asked me out and he saw me across the bar, as one does, and asked me out. And I said, yes, what a lovely idea and stood him up because I was at the bar and didn't go on our date. And then he asked me out again, and I stood him up a second time. And then he asked me out a third time, and I stood him up again, at which point he came knocking on the door and said he was going to break up with me. Go figure. At which point, when he said he was going to break up with me, I thought, I've got to have you. You can't possibly break up with me. Don't you know who I am? And I promptly actually started to catch him. Why is this important? Because within three months, we were engaged, and between six months, I was married, and I was 19, 20, 21. And the reason I needed this man in my life was because he was strong, he was determined, uh, he was going to run my life for me, because I certainly wasn't going to run my own life, my drinking, uh, I couldn't stop drinking, and he told me I wasn't allowed to drink. Well, this is the man for me. He's going to tell me to stop, and I will. And so I did. I slowed down. I drank socially for the next umpteen years. He put a ring on my finger. I then rebelled against everything that I loved about him and spent the next 11 years fighting with him. Again, the drinking was, I was living in South Africa at this point, and uh, you always walk around with a bottle under your arm, either because it's nearly lunchtime, it is lunchtime, it's after lunchtime, it's sundowner time, it's nearly dinner, or it's after dinner. So there was always a bottle of wine under my arm. 
And um, again, it wasn't um, totally out of control uh, because of the social circumstances that I was in, the crowd that I was in, his family, et cetera. None of them were drinkers. So it, I managed to control it. It wasn't, it wasn't ridiculous. <clears throat> I then decided 11 years of arguments was more than I wanted to be. And I was becoming, again, I didn't like who I was becoming, so I moved again. And this time I moved back, to, I moved to Greece. And when I was in Greece, then I uh, drank alcoholically and could not control it. And at that point, I had two, three years where it was just totally out of control. And... Um, Eventually, I came, uh, somebody, a friend of mine that I used to drink with uh, had started a meeting in Crete, and she said that she would, um, I think she, ought, she thought that I ought to come along. So I said, okay, fine, I'll come along. I don't know what it is, but I'll try anything once. Let me give it a go. And um, that's exactly what I did. So I went to this meeting, and I sat at the back of the meeting. Please note, there were exactly five or six people. It wasn't exactly a large meeting. But I heard people share about, I heard people share about their stories. I heard them laugh. I heard them talk about there was a way out of this. If I didn't pick up a drink, I could actually have a life beyond my wildest dreams. I heard them reading from the big book, which was gobbledygook. I heard a lot of things that, that made my hair kind of go like this and my ears flat. And then they asked me to talk. And they asked me to share why was I here or whatever. And I can't remember what I said. I just know that when I came into my first AA meeting for the first time in my life, I actually felt I'd come home. It's the only way that I can put it. These were people who were living in my head. They'd obviously been recording my conversations in my head because they were saying the same things and thinking the same things. They were behaving the same way. I couldn't understand how they could know me when I'd never met any of these people before. It was most extraordinary. So I totally identified with the group, the few that were there. And um, because it was a new group, and I mean literally just months old, the two visitors that were there, because it's a summer place that in summer it's full of visitors and in winter there's very few people there. The two visitors had five years and everybody else had months or weeks um, so we didn't have a lot of sobriety between us, but we all kind of got sober together. And after I'd been there about six months, I think, uh, one of the guys decided that he was going to go for a swim after taking a drink and just kept on swimming and left a wife and a baby behind, a two-year-old. And she had the, the woman who brought me in, Anna. So that was a big shock for me because at that point, I realized that if I really wanted this program, then I'd better stick pretty, pretty damn close. So that's the kind of experience. That's my history, if you like. And um, what has that got to do? What, how can a newcomer identify with any of that? Well, all I can say is that I couldn't imagine life without drink. It's as simple as that. I couldn't imagine life without drink. I was told, just don't pick up the first drink, you won't get drunk. Well, don't be daft. How am I supposed to live life without drink? I don't know how to do that. No idea. So, well, just don't pick up a drink for today. Well, it's 10 o'clock at night. That's not going to be difficult. Well, don't pick one up tomorrow morning when you wake up and then try and last until breakfast and then try and last until lunchtime and see it through that way. Whatever. Okay. Uh, so I did stay away from the drink because I was a binge drinker before that. And um, I did stay away from the drink. And then what happened after about a couple of weeks or months or whatever it was, I can't remember, it's quite a while ago, um, the compulsion came. The absolute desire for a drink, the feeling that I was going to kill somebody if I didn't have a drink right that very minute. I had gone through the getting rid of the drink in my house. I had gone through the debating who my friends are who were going to support me in not drinking and who I was going to drop because I couldn't afford to hang around with people who did drink if I wanted to stay sober. So I was trying to do the right things. And the craving came regardless. I was going to meetings, I was talking to people, but the craving came and I had no idea how to deal with it. And then I remembered, don't pick up the first drink and you won't get drunk. Fine, I'm not going to leave the house. So I had this compulsion to drink. I cannot describe it. It was so strong. 
I paced up and down that 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 flat of mine. I paced up and down. I was I could have screamed. I was feeling like a caged tiger. I was absolutely desperate for a drink. And I remember this voice from somebody saying, "Keep busy. Keep your hands busy." Just don't pick up a drink for the moment. Just don't pick up a drink right now. Just keep it in the moment. How do I do that? Just keep your hands busy. So I couldn't think of anything. It said, polish your shoes, smell the flowers, do something. And I couldn't think of anything. So I got a toothbrush and I got some SIF equivalent and I started polishing this marble floor, which didn't need polishing. And I was cleaning it. And I was cleaning it and I looked up at the clock and it was like, I can't cope with five minutes, three, no, can't, one minute. Yeah, I can not pick up a drink. In one minute, I will pick up a drink. And I thinking, well, polish that toothbrush on the floor. The minute went, oh, in one minute, I'll pick up a drink. And I did a second minute. And then it went to four minutes. And then it went to however many minutes it was. And then before I knew it, half an hour had gone past and I hadn't had a drink. I remember standing up, looking at the clock because my back was sore, seeing the clock and seeing that half an hour or maybe it was 20 minutes, but half an hour had gone by and I hadn't had a drink. And for the first time in my life, I believed what it said in this big book. There is hope. For the first time, I actually believed I might be one of those that might get it as opposed to one of those that don't get it. It talks about in chapter five. And with that hope, that strengthened me in my in my program. And I really started to work it then because I thought, you know what? I'm really going to listen to these people. I thought they might be right because I had the faith that they might be right. Now I absolutely had the belief. I absolutely had the belief because I could see it. It was working in me and I never, ever, ever thought that I'd be able to survive without a drink and certainly not when the craving came. I just didn't think it would happen, but it did. And... Then I started to work the program. I started to do the steps. I did all the steps uh, within eight months, I think. I can't say I did them brilliantly, but I did them to the best of my ability. Um, I, I was there, yes, it was about six, eight months. And the guy, Colin, uh, who, was, who was a brilliant sponsor, um, told me that I needed to do step four with a woman because there were no women, all the women had dropped out or gone drinking or whatever. Um, and I had no money. At this point, I was one of those people who had two children, no husband, no money, no training, no means of earning any money, et cetera, et cetera. Money was so tight. I was down to you know a couple of pounds, really, really keeping it, <laughs> trying to work my money the best way that I could. And I actually asked my money for the money to, to take a, a, a boat to, to Athens because I discovered a woman there who'd be able to do my uh, steps with me, to do my fifth step with me. <laughs> Excuse me. When I got off the boat, I found a taxi. I asked the taxi man to take me to this woman's address. I had exactly 1,000 drachmas which is not a lot of money. And when the 1,000 money, the 1,000 drachmas came up on the, on the little machine, I told him to stop the car because I had to get out. And he said, what do you mean? I haven't got you there. And I said, I don't have the money for the rest of the journey. And he said, oh, what do you mean? I said, I've got exactly 1,000 drachmas and your, your chitty on the thing says 1,000 drachmas. And he says, no, no, I'm going to take you. Don't worry. I said, but I can't pay you back. He says, you pay me when you get back. Don't worry. Just send me the money. And bless him. He took me to this woman's house where I stayed for three days because I'm an alcoholic. If one page is good, 50,000 million pages must be much better. So for three days, I bored her to death with my step five. When I eventually got back home and tried to phone this man to give him his money and get his address, the, the number was a wrong one. And all I can say is in that moment, I discovered God. That was one of my most profound experiences of God working in my life, that he turned up, that he was kind, not all taxi drivers are kind, and that he allowed me to get to this woman to do what I needed to do. And for that, I'm extremely grateful. I then went back home and continued everything that I needed to do with my step work, et cetera. And at that point, uh, my father died a year later. I was a year sober when my father died. Um, 
he wasn't well. And uh, I'd broken up with my English boyfriend at this point because he didn't want to marry me. Doesn't he know who I am? I'm so wonderful. No, 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 you don't want to marry me. That's fine. So I broke up with him and he discovered that he rather, rather liked me after all and asked me to come to England to see if we could be together and if I would like to move to England. So I went over for a month and during that month, sober, um, halfway through my father died when I was in England and he was in Greece. I had no idea how to deal with this. I had no tools. I was a year sober. I was in a country that I knew absolutely nobody, apart from the man that I was possibly, you know, going to marry or live with or whatever, or move over for. I didn't know what to do. Colin had moved back to England, so I phoned him and he said, get your ass to a meeting. Duh, why didn't I think of that? So I grabbed the children and I went off to the centre of London, to Hind Street, for those of you that are from London. And I found two meetings, one after the other. The children had to do colouring in in the corridor because they obviously weren't allowed in the meeting. And I bawled my eyes out in the meeting and I shared that my father had died the day before. My mother told me I wasn't allowed to go to the funeral. Mm -hmm. So this is one of the reasons why I was so upset because I'd been caring for him during that year that he was uh, poorly. And um, I didn't need to pick up a drink. I did not pick up a drink even though he died. I loved him dearly. I cared for him. I'd looked after him. I said goodbye to him. Dad, you may not be here when I get back. I'm going for a whole month. And he said, that's all right, darling. I know that or whatever he said. I don't know exactly. But, you know, you get my drift. And during the two, halfway through my month, after two weeks, on the 15th of August, he died. And I went to a meeting. It's the very first thing that I did. And I stayed for the second meeting. It was the second thing I did. And then I went back back to the house that I, that I was staying with, with Richard. <clears throat> At that point, he then said, would you like to come over? And I came over. And why am I saying all of this? Because none of this did I need to pick up a drink for. I moved countries. I moved back to England with two children, no money, moving in with a man that I didn't really know that well. I've known him a lot of years, but I did know that I loved him very, very much. So I moved to England. I found a new sponsor. I started all over again, did the steps again. My ex-husband was, was who he was. And during the five, first five years of my sobriety, I worked ex extremely hard on my steps. And I mean, I really, really worked hard on all my steps. I got to the point that I was able to forgive my husband. He would come out and see the children every year. He lives in South Africa. He would come out every year. And in year two that he came out, Richard said, why doesn't he come and stay in the house instead of staying in the hotel? Now, that to me shows me that I'd done my steps because I had forgiveness when this is the man that I wanted to kill. And at one point, I actually, had I had a knife, I know without fail that I had the white rage and I would have killed him had I been in the kitchen. I happened to be in the bathroom, so I didn't. But I was able to talk to him, forgive him explain who I was, who he was, what had happened, my sobriety, et cetera, et cetera, during that period. And we came to a very loving and amicable arrangement. And so he would come and stay with Richard and me. And then he'd go back to his wife, because obviously he had a wife. And I was able to deal with that, which I think is amazing, considering where I'd come from and how acrimonious. The Let me just put this into perspective. Normally, when people divorce, you take the children, the husband keeps the children, or the wife keeps the children. It depends on the situation, or sometimes you've got visiting rights to both. I left him in the middle of the night, moved into a flat to be away from him, and moved to another town. When the divorce was final, I left the country, and I didn't tell him. I'm not proud of my behavior, I have to tell you. I had to do a lot of work on that. We talked about it, and I said to him, this is what I want to do. I'm in Greece now. Are you okay with me staying here? And he said, yes. I think it's the best thing for the children. I had a lot of guilt to deal with with that, and that came up very much in my step work. I had a lot of guilt to deal with that because I'd taken his children away. And to this day, I don't feel great about it, I'll be honest. It wasn't the best thing I ever did, not my finest moment, but it was a matter of survival. And if there's one thing I've discovered is that I'm a survivor. 
so I moved to uh, I moved to um, Greece, as I said, and then I moved to England. And during the time that I was in England and I made my amends to my husband and we got on and everything was hunky-dory, the next umpteen years are irrelevant. They're all about sobriety and my sobriety was good. I did a lot of service. I did a lot of service. Um, and then in as the years were going past, my husband was approaching retirement time and I was really looking forward to him retiring. Again, my sobriety was good. Nothing wrong with it. I had sponsees, I had a sponsor, I was going to meetings, I was doing service at lots of different levels, and, and I had a regular service level that gave me an enormous amount of joy. I've done service since the first day that I came in. My first service was emptying the ashtrays and putting the chairs away and doing the washing up. My second service when I came to England was washing up, and that is actually when I learned to start trusting people. Washing up is actually one of the best things you can ever do if you're a newcomer. Why? Because you're talking one-on-one. -on -one. You're not surrounded in a meeting and feeling overwhelmed by all the people or, or having to talk to your sponsor and confess your sins. You know, washing up is a nice, gentle way of actually getting to know people, of getting to know myself and learning to trust people little by little. And as I let out a little bit of who I was, they responded beautifully. And when I let out a little bit more, like a fishing line, they responded beautifully. And I learned for the first time in my life to trust people. I'd never trusted anybody, not even my parents. Couldn't trust them. So when I, when I came in uh, at this point, my husband was about to retire. <clears throat> One day he turned around, he says, darling, I can't get to the top of the stairs. I said, what do you mean? He says, I can't breathe. Cut a very long story short, he was diagnosed with lung cancer as a non-smoker. He was extremely healthy. He walked, he ran, he cycled, he played tennis, he did all of these wonderful things because he was a very clever man, unlike Lazy Bones, he would never did a damn thing. When we discovered that we had to go to the oncology and hematology department was when I realized that he had cancer. When I realized he had cancer, the end of my world had arrived. To tell you that I loved this man would be an understatement. I was very, very privileged to have a wonderful husband who I loved a lot. And to have him ill with stage four was unbelievably painful. I can't even begin to tell you how painful it was. And I just remember he went out somewhere or other, and I just remember standing in the house screaming my head off, just screaming. I never questioned why. I didn't say to God, you know, why have you done this? Because God has his plan. I don't always know what it is. I didn't want to accept it, but I did. And because my head was just like absolutely bonkers, before I knew it, I was on my hands and knees washing that bloody floor. And I only realized it when I stood up and I looked and I thought, good God, what have I been doing? Oh, heavens above, I've been washing the floor. I went back to basics. Exactly the same thing I did when I first got sober, and I didn't even know it. I did it in an automatic AA way. I did my survival thing. What do I have to do to survive? I have to not pick up a drink. I have to keep busy because my head's up my ass and talking to people isn't going to help. And that's exactly what I did. And when I stood up, I remember standing up and like I did first time, I thought, I'm going to cope. I'm going to be all right. I don't have to pick up a drink. I'm going to be okay. And that's exactly what happened. I relied on my higher power. He became my walking stick. You know, that little triangle you see where we have old age people home and they're all kind of bent over and they're holding a stick. It's terribly inappropriate, totally on PC. But anyway, that walking stick and that little old lady was me because I had to rely 100% on my higher power. I could not rely on any people. It had to be my higher power. And my higher power helped me through. I managed everything knowing that it was God's will, whatever it was. The good, the bad, and everything in between. And it was okay. And I went to meetings, and I went to meetings, and I talked incessantly, and I bored everybody to tears. 
But you know what? People saw that I didn't pick up a drink. I did not pick up a drink under the most awful circumstances. I did not pick up a drink and I didn't have a desire for a drink. I have no idea why I've got this program and other people haven't. I have no idea why I have something that people have to die for. What I'd like to say to the newcomer is this is my story. Okay, this is my story. It doesn't end there. It has not ended there. He eventually died. What I didn't tell you was that the year that he was diagnosed, my sister was also diagnosed with a brain tumor. She was uh, benign at that particular point, but within two years, she was uh, she had cancer. She had melanoma, uh, not melanoma, um, the other one, whatever it's called, where your glands come up. And uh, then in 2020, so he died in 19, uh, 2019, which obviously was extremely difficult. And the 2019, I don't remember at all, very little. And then in uh, 2020, I decided in 2019, the year that he died, that I had to keep busy because otherwise I wouldn't be able to cope. And um, I booked a lot of holidays, walking holidays, please note not sitting on a beach holidays, just because I needed to exercise and get out of the house and get out of my head and, and do stuff. And when I came back from my second walking holiday, uh, I was told that I wasn't allowed to go out of the house. A friend of mine phoned me up and I said, oh, how are you? I haven't seen you. I've just got back. Da, da, da. She says, well, I hope you're not coming to the do on Thursday. You've been on an aeroplane and you've got, you may have COVID and we don't want it. So please don't come to the party on Thursday. And that was my opening statement within it. I hadn't even unpacked my bags or put my bags down. I was so excited to be back and tell her all about it. And what I got was a flea in my ear. Crikey. Okay. I've got no milk. I've got no bread. I've got no vegetables. I've been away for a while. I've got no this, no that. I've got nothing to eat. How am I going to manage this? I can't even make a cup of tea. I don't even have any milk for a cup of tea because I don't keep UHT milk. So it was like a real shock to the system, to be honest. And then I thought, well, pfft, I'll manage somehow. I'll ask somebody to go and get me some milk. And I opened the back door and there were rats running around the back door. I went to flush the toilet and the flush, the toilet wouldn't flush. Turns out that my sewers were completely and absolutely blocked. And when I went to have a shower the next morning, the window had broken and I couldn't close the window. So I had to have a shower in a cold room. This was March. So within three days of being back, I had an empty house with nobody in it because obviously my daughter was, you know, in London and my son was in Italy. I had rats at the back. If I went out the front, I'd be caught. So I wouldn't, couldn't get to the shops at the front. So I was totally and absolutely isolated because I had COVID, I was COVID isolated. I couldn't even get to a meeting. I have never been so scared in my life. I have to tell you the next year was the probably one of the worst year and a half was the worst of my life because I lost God and how did I lose God I allowed fear to rule my life the moment that I came back from that holiday fear took over and God went out the window he went on holiday and he didn't spend send me a postcard I didn't know where he was I would pray I'd say well never mind that the heating has gone off and it's broken at least I have food in the house and I have a roof over my head. Then something else would go wrong. Then something else. I cannot tell you. I made a long list when I was doing my steps recently of everything that went wrong with the house. And it's just like pages and pages and pages. And the, what for most people, this would not be a problem. But you have to remember that Richard used to do everything for me. He used to do everything for me. He was, a, he was an engineer, you know, he was a DIY man. So I, could, I didn't know how to cope with these things. So the fear kept on coming and the fear kept on coming. No thought of a drink, but I had no idea where God was. That's all right, God. I trust you. I know that you're doing this. This is fine. I have no idea what this is, blah, blah, blah. Eventually, I moved in with my daughter. Everything changed. I, I sold the house. I, I moved in with my daughter. I moved in with my daughter on the 13th of May. And on the 14th of May, she decided to have a baby. And on the 14th of May, after she'd had the baby, I left to go back to my old home to finish packing. So 
you know, it's been one crisis after another. And I need to finish. And um, what I'm trying to say at the end of this is why am I telling you my life story, which has nothing to do with booze, is because it's got everything to do with booze. It's got everything to do with AA. I did not need to pick up a drink during any of these things. I've had to practice all the principles. I've had to use all the tools. I've had to use the serenity prayer. I've had to do loads and loads of things. But the most important thing is that when my sister died in September this year, I moved to this new house where I started to get a little bit of peace and quiet and serenity. And during the time that I was here, I started to hear God again because I stopped filling my diary. I stopped filling my head. I stopped filling my time. And I allowed God to talk to me. I sat still in the garden every morning. That helped me to calm down and to let go of the fear. I went, I got to the point where, I mean, obviously some of these things obviously all run at the same time, but um, during the time that I've been in this house, I've been to three conventions. I haven't been to three, I haven't been to convention for seven years or probably about 10 actually because of Richard and Tina being ill. And at one of these conventions, I knew that I needed a sponsor and I heard this woman speak and I knew that she was the woman for me. Why? I'll show you why. Because she kicks my ass. <laughs> this is a woman. As you can see, I'm obviously quite a strong person. And I need somebody who is as strong as me, if not stronger. She kicks my ass. Yeah, but. <laughs> I started my steps. It's the best thing I've ever done. Why? Because I haven't done them for 10 years. And I have to say, I need to do them because I don't like who I've become. As a result of having this new sponsor, I started at step one. Well, actually, I started before, you know, with all the different bits that you have to do before you get to step one. And I also have a sponsee. I've had sponsees all through the all through COVID. The first sponsee, by the way, came as soon as COVID happened. She had she came to me about three or four months. I've known her seven years, and she came to me and said, "I want you to be my sponsor." She took me through COVID. I didn't take her through her steps. She took me through my steps. I can tell you, she phoned me every bloody day at the same time. It was like, oh, my God, she's serious. I don't know anybody who keeps time like that. I better get my arse into gear. I had to get my arse into gear. I had to read the fucking, excuse me, I had to read the book before she did. So I knew what I was going to talk to her about. I had to do my bloody steps. I did them. We did very, very well. She fired me about three months ago. Okay, it's fine. Uh, she obviously outgrew me, and that's perfectly wonderful. I have a new sponsee who, same thing, she just went, you're the woman for me. And, and uh, she's keeping me on my toes as well. And I'm reading the book with her. And then I'm reading it with my sponsor. It's a different book, by the way. I have to tell you, somebody's rewriting it in between the two. The one that I'm reading with my sponsee is perfect for her. And the one that I'm doing with my sponsor is perfect for me. But they're not the same book. The one that I'm reading, I'm reading line by line and kind of going, oh, I've forgotten that. Oh, I didn't know that. Wow, is that what it means? This program is amazing. I'm not the same person that I was before I even started these steps a few months ago. I'm better, hopefully. <laughs> I'm not cured. I'm a bit better. And all I can say is I'm very grateful for the meetings. Uh, Christmas last year, I got COVID just before Christmas Day. I was going to go see my sister Tina, the one who died. Uh, we booked everything. She went to buy the food. My daughter had COVID. She came in and says, guess what? I'm COVID free at last. And I said, guess what? I have COVID. She shut the door and she went out. So I then spent 10 days on my own. She went somewhere else for Christmas and I had Christmas on my own. You know what? I've never had Christmas on my own before. I'm 68 and I've never had Christmas on my own before. But I've had it now so I can tick that box and go yippee yippee yay yay. And I'll go on with one final thing about how important meetings are for me and the program is for me. <clears throat> I went to a lunch the other day about a week ago and it finished at about four o'clock and I was wandering around the streets of London. I don't live in London, so this is a special treat. Wandering around the streets of London and I saw the pretty lights. I thought, oh, lovely, lovely, lovely. I wonder if there's a meeting here tonight somewhere near me so I don't have to go too far. Ah, there's one in Soho. I'm near Soho. No problem. It's at six. 
well, I'm in theatre land. I wonder if I can get a cheap ticket for a tenner or something. So I went into a theatre and they said, no, it starts at seven. Oh, that's not going to work. The meeting's between six and seven. If I go to the theatre, it means I definitely can't go to the meeting. It might be nice to go for a meeting. I think I have to do the meeting. I'm in London. I have to do the meeting. I went to this meeting. It was very good, blah, blah, blah. On the way home, there was a theatre open. They had cheap tickets. I bought one. I went to the theatre as well. How wonderful that I can do these things today, but especially how wonderful that I chose AA first over the, over the, um, over the theatre. This may sound like a high-class problem, but AA is everything to me. Always has been and always will be. I never stuck to anything before in my life, nothing, except my, my second husband. He was around a long time. And I've kept my children because they know them still. They haven't divorced me yet. <laughs> But AA is the only thing that I've done forever. You know, anything else comes and goes, but AA has been an absolute constant. And I'm very grateful for the wonderful, wonderful life that I've had today. You know, when I've been fearful, I've done what Susan Jeffrey says, feel the fear and do it anyway. When I was in a really uh, unwell relationships, I went to meetings that were codependent no more. You know, one of these... Uh, um, I don't know. I've been to so many 12 step meetings over the years. I can't remember what it's called right now. This is the very second. I've been to the Al Anon. I've been to the SLAA. I've been to dozens of these things. And you know what? All of them added to my sobriety because all of them tagged onto something in my personality or in my history that could help me to get better. All the self help books that I've read before I came into AA, they came back into use after AA because I was able to go back and go, oh, that's my problem. Okay. And as for God, God was in through all of this. And I never had a God before I came into AA. I was searching and searching. And I went to every, I went to synagogues and I went to Hindu temples and I believed in reincarnation for a while and I did meditations and I was going to go to India and you name it, I've done it. I've looked at it. Blah, 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 blah. Do you know what? God is referred to in so many different ways in the big book. Forget the actual word God. To me, it is something that is not me. And AA was my higher power for about three or four years. I couldn't believe in a God, a religious God, and I couldn't understand the spiritual side. Why don't you think of it as a group of drunks, AA? Yeah, that can do that. All of them combined, no more than I do. Even I have to admit that with my arrogance and my big head. Even I have to admit that. So... I came to eventually believe in a power that was more than just AA because AA is full of human beings and eventually they do let you down. And I came eventually to believe in a power that is greater than myself who I choose to call God today. And that's been my journey. And the God has actually seen me through the most extraordinary things, both good and bad. I don't question the path that I have to lead. It is just what it is. And I'm very happy with the life that I lead. I didn't like the shit that I went through. I'll be honest, for the year and a half that I was going through it, but you know what? It's made me stronger today. I have to think. I hope. I also don't know why I went through it. But anyway, it's just what it is. Very happy to be here today. Thank you for asking me. And I hope you got something out of it. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.